It's good to see everyone, and wonderful to see all these people being baptized, yeah. professing their faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, my wife already said this, but I'm going to repeat it. If you've never been baptized, uh, we'd sure love to see you baptized if you've made a commitment to Jesus Christ and you've made him your Lord and Savior. It's a wonderful way to profess to the world that uh, your faith is real and that you're going to follow him. You know, the Bible's kind of interesting because it tells us that we have to confess that Jesus is Lord in order to be saved. But the reason it says that is because what we confess to, we're committed to. That's one of the reasons we don't want to confess that we're a Christian at work is because if we say we're a Christian, then people watch us and when we screw up, what do they do? I thought you said you were a Christian. Yeah. So one of the things that the Bible wants us to do is he wants us to commit to Jesus Christ for people to know. And the best way to do that is to confess that Jesus Christ is your Lord. Anyways, I've got a lot to cover. I want to make sure that I get it all because we're going to try and end this with something special. I want to make sure I have enough time to do that. So let's get going. This will be the third and final sermon in our series on the subject of marriage and more specifically the wedding vows which of course to me is the most important part of the ceremony. Now the reason it's the most important part of the ceremony is because the wedding vows are required before a couple can be legally joined as husband and wife, at least in the eyes of God. In other words, before I pronounce a, cus a, a, a couple husband and wife, they must make a vow to God that they willingly and voluntarily are entering into a covenant relationship with each other until death separates them. And notice that I said they must make a vow unto God. You see, contrary to what most people think and even what most pastors think, the vows are not promises couples make to each other with God being the witness to the promises they just made. No, that's why we call them wedding vows and not wedding oaths. The wedding vows are promises couples make to God and men are the witnesses to what they promised. So the bottom line is this, when it comes to a wedding ceremony, the couple is entering into a covenant relationship with each other. But to enter into that sacred covenant relationship, the bride and groom must take a vow. That's why the wedding vows are the most important part of the wedding ceremony. The vows are a requirement for entering into a covenant relationship as husband and wife. Now this morning what we're going to do is we're going to look at the traditional wedding vows and I'm going to explain what each part means. Because if you're making this vow unto God, then you need to know exactly what you're vowing to do. To be honest with you, I'm always amazed at the number of people, people who are getting married, that will say, I do, and they don't have a clue as to what they're promising to do. Yeah. And they're not just promising to do what the pastor asked of them or what I asked of them, but they're promising to God to do certain things. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the traditional wedding vows and I'm going to explain what each part actually means. But before I do that, I need to mention the fact that you won't find the wedding vows in the Bible. You can't turn to the book of Malachi or to the book of Jeremiah or even to the beginning of the book of Genesis and find a certain chapter and a certain verses that actually give us the traditional wedding vows. No, they're not in the Bible, but they're based on the Bible. And you'll see that as we go through the vows and we look at each part, but they're not actually in the Bible. So let me explain its history. The traditional wedding vows were first recorded in 1549 in the Book of Common Prayer used by the Church of England. It was written by an Anglican priest by the name of Thomas Cranmer. He was the leader of the English Reformation and the Archbishop of Canterbury during the reigns of King Henry VIII, Edward VI, and Mary I. But what he wrote was based on the Latin liturgical rite that was used by the Catholic Church, dating all the way back to sometime around the 11th century. When the English Reformation took place, Thomas Cranmer modified the Catholic rite, basing it on scripture rather than the traditions of the church. So as I said, the traditional wedding vows are based on the Bible, but they're not actually in the Bible. They're based on scriptures you find in the Bible. Now, if you want to go deeper, I suggest that you study the traditions of an ancient Jewish wedding. You see, when the early church split from Judaism 
shortly after the destruction of temple of the temple because that was really the catalyst that caused the separation of Christianity from Judaism. People, Jesus was a Jew. All of the disciples were Jews. Jesus was and is the Jewish Messiah. When he comes back to rule and reign during the millennium, he will rule and reign from Jerusalem. Yeah. So in the very beginning, Christianity was not separate from Judaism. But after the destruction of the temple, there was a great animosity to be, uh, towards Christians because the majority of Jews felt like the Christians had abandoned them. Because they took Jesus' words to heart that when they see the city surrounded, they're to flee. And of course, you've heard me talk about the history uh, of the falling temple and, and, and Jerusalem. That actually, uh, the Romans came in, they surrounded the city, but their supply line was not secure. So after two weeks, they pulled back. Well, once the Christians saw that the city had been surrounded, they were reminded of Jesus' words. So they, they uh, actually packed their bags and they left town. And they went to what is now modern-day Jordan. And the Jews who remained behind felt like they'd been abandoned as a result of that. There was a great animosity towards Christianity. Now, there was already an animosity there because they didn't believe that Jesus was the Christ or the Messiah. But that was the ceiling block. And as a result of that, Christianity and Judaism separated and went their own way. Well, when the early church split from Judaism shortly after the destruction of the temple, it began forming its own traditions and rites based on scripture, but also on Jewish customs and culture. So the traditions of a Jewish wedding at the time of Jesus heavily, heavily influenced Christian weddings. Plus, a lot of our eschatological doctrines are based on the, on the uh, customs of the ancient Jewish wedding, which only makes sense because the marriage covenant is patterned after the covenant between Christ and the church. We need to understand that. And because it's patterned after the covenant between Christ and the church, we see a lot of similarities. So if you want to understand eschatology, you have to understand ancient Jewish weddings. Does that make sense? Now, the best place to start is with the ketubah, which is the Hebrew word for marital contract. I also recommend that you study the ketubot in the Babylonian Talmud. The Ketubot is a tractate of the Mishnah and Talmud in the order of Nahim. The Ketubot deals with the vari a variety of marital responsibilities, especially those that are intended for the marital contract. Now, recently I had someone from Denmark email me, and they wanted to ask, where are you getting all of this information? I want to know more about the Ketubah. I want to know more about an ancient Jewish wedding, the Jewish marital contract. So hopefully he's watching today because I'm going to tell you where I'm getting my information. And, and let me just say this. The Ketubot provides a wealth of information as well as the Encyclopedia of Judaism. I have an extensive research library. How many of you know the difference between a reading library and a research library? A reading library is for pleasure. I have a pretty good reading library. I, believe it or not, I like to read. And so while I'm on vacation, I will read fiction. So I have a pretty extensive uh, reading library. But I also have a research library. I have over 8,000 physical books in my research library and over 12,000 e-books on Lagos. So altogether, I have about 20,000 books in my research library. Now, what a research library is, it's a place where you have resources that you can come in and you can begin to study things. So it's more of an academic level. So if I want to study Jewish weddings and at the time of Jesus Christ, then I want to start studying certain resources that talk about that. And two of the best places, and the person's watching from Denmark, let me just say this, is from the Babylonian Talmud. These two volumes come from 42 volumes of the Babylonian Talmud. This is the Koran Talmud Bavli. Bavli simply means Babylonian ta uh, Babylonia. So this is the Babylonian Talmud. Koran's the actually publisher. But anyways, 
What's interesting about this is these two volumes deal with marriage. Now, how many of you know what the Talmud is? The Talmud is actually the Mishnah and the Gemara. The Mishnah is the oral law. How many of you remember when Jesus Christ made the comment? He said, the commandments of men have made the laws of God of none effect. I'm paraphrasing. But what he was doing is he was getting on to the Pharisees because of the oral law. Now, the Pharisees believe that when God gave the law to Moses, he gave the written law, which is what we have in the Bible, the Jewish Bible, but he also gave the oral law. And then it goes all the way back to Moses, but that's not true. We know that it actually came into existence after the Babylonian captivity. Because what took place is, after the Babylonian captivity, well, I'm going to have to move fast. After the Babylonian captivity, and actually during it, all of the Jewish scholars were together and they were asking the question, why were we carried into captivity? And the reason they were carried into captivity is because they didn't keep the law. The reason they had to do 70 years in captivity is because they had not given the land rest for 490 years. Every seven years the land was supposed to rest. They had not kept the law. As a result of that, Jesus said, or God said, Jesus is God, so we can say Jesus did Christophany. But anyways, God said, you're going to serve 70 years. We find that in the book of Jeremiah because they didn't keep the law. So what they said was the reason the people aren't keeping the law is because they don't know what they need to do in order to keep the law. And the only way they can keep us from going into captivity again is we need to build a fence around the law. And what they meant by that is the Bible says, as an example, that you're to keep the Sabbath and not do any work. Well, the people need to know what work is. So they started coming up with what was known as the oral law. Work is defined as this. That's why they were always after Jesus. It's because Jesus didn't practice the oral law. He practiced the wit written law. And that's why he said the commandments of men, talking about their oral law, has made the word of God of none effect. And he was using, and he was actually citing that for one specific example, and I won't give that. But that's why they always had a tough time with Jesus. It's because Jesus did not recognize the oral law, but he recognized the written law. So the Mishnah is the oral law. And at the time of Jesus, it was actually a little bit higher than the written word of God. Yeah. The Gemara is simply the commentary of the Mishnah. So what the Talmud is, it's an interpretation or translation of the Mishnah into whatever your language is. For us, it would be English. And it's the Gemara, commentary on the Mishnah. So if we want to know what Jesus, uh, what happened or what Jews believed during the time of Jesus, we go to the Talmud. And here's what's interesting. Two whole books are all about the Ketubah. Yeah. And this is actually, if you see this, the Ketubat. The marital contract. So you wonder, where in the world is he getting all of these things? I'm getting it out of the Talmud. And I'm also getting some of the information from the Encyclopedia of Judaica. That's a 22-volume set. And it has a lot to say about it. But we need to actually come in and study those things to find out what did they believe at the time of Jesus. And that's where I'm getting my information. How many of you wondered where I was getting all my information? All right. Now you know. In fact, when I start my podcast, I'm actually going to show you my library, show you how I use my library, and how I set up Logos to be able to do things uh, more speedily. Because I have to do things quickly. And I'll show you that. Anyways, now that you know the history of the traditional wedding vows... Let's look at each part. Let's find out what each part actually means. So let's put the traditional wedding vows on the back wall and let's read it as a whole. And then we're going to look at each part separately. And here's the vow starting with the men. If you are ever asked to actually officiate it, many times you can get ordained online. Someone asks you to do their wedding. The man always goes first. Why is that when it comes to the wedding vows? Because the man's supposed to be the spiritual leader of the family. His vow to God 
goes first. If you're a feminist, get over it. You want your husband to be the man of God that God wants him to be? Then he needs to go first and lead in the air of spirituality. So here's what it says. Do you take this woman to be your lawful wife? To have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish, till death do you part. Now, people, this is all one vow. It has many parts to it, but it's one vow. Now, the reason we refer to it as vows plural is because both parties are required to make this vow. So, two vows are being made, one by the groom and one by the bride. So, we call them wedding vows plural but it's actually one vow being made by two people and no that is not a texas longhorn sign please don't email me all right or how about this one vow two no better all my people in texas are going to be upset anyways two people so let's look at each part of the vow the first part is do you take this woman to be your lawful wife now, again, this vow is meant to be recited by the bride and groom. However, most people suffer from stage fright, so they don't want to speak publicly. So to accommodate people, what we do is we put the vow into the form of a question. So the bride and groom only have to say two words, I do. And sometimes they still can't get it right. I'm asking the groom that, and he looks at me and he says, yeah. And I usually say, excuse me, yes, excuse me, I do. That's good. I don't want to hear, oh yeah. <laughs> this is a very important vow that you're making to God. Now, do you see why you want Bobby to do your wedding and not a crotchety old minister? <laughs> yeah. Now, the vow begins with, do you take the person standing next to you and the reason I say it that way is because the bride will make this vow too, to be your lawful wife. Now, we don't just say wife, we say lawful wife. You see, marriage is a covenant relationship. In other words, it is a marital contract. That's what ketubah means. It means marital contract. And these two volumes deal with the marital contract. Yeah. 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 What did they put in this thing? A lot. It's kind of interesting. Do I have time to go off on a tangent? At the time of Jesus, when did virgins, what day of the week did virgins get married? Anyone know? If you were a virgin, what day of the week did you want to be married on? You wanted to be married... On a Wednesday. Anyone know why? Here's why. A virgin is married on Wednesday and a widow on Thursday. The reason for the form is that twice a week courts convene in the towns on Mondays and Thursdays. So if the husband has a claim concerning the bride's virginity when consummating the marriage on Wednesday night, he would go early the next day to the court and make his claim. It's called the tokens of her virginity. You'll find that in the book of Deuteronomy. So what took place is if you married a woman who claimed to be a virgin and on your wedding night you discover she's not a virgin, then you want to have your wedding annulled. So what do you do? You have to go to the court, show the tokens of her virginity. In the case if she's not a virgin, there's no tokens. And the wedding's going to be annulled. So in order to be able to do that, it became customary if you were a virgin to be married on Wednesday. So today we wear a white dress, which means purity. You're supposed to be a virgin. But you went further in the days of Jesus and you got married on a Wednesday. If you didn't get married on a Wednesday, guess what people would think? <laughs> she must not have been a virgin. Yeah. See, if I teach this, people go, where'd you get that? The Talmud people. Yeah. Anyways, I just thought that was pretty good. But anyways... Well, we don't just say that I take this woman to be my wife. I say I take this woman to be my lawful wife because marriage is a covenant relationship. In other words, it's a marital contract. That's why you must have a license and it must be recorded down at the county courthouse. If not, you're not legally married. And I tell people, if you don't have a license, 
I'm not going to do the wedding. Really? Yeah, you better make sure you have the license. Because I only do legal weddings. Yeah. Now, during the Old Testament period, and also at the time of Jesus, the marriage ceremony was divided into two parts. The first part was the ketubah. The ketubah was like a prenuptial agreement. It was a covenant laying out the terms of the proposed marriage. And it included what was known as the mohar, which was the bridal price. In other words, it was the price the bridegroom was willing to pay in order to marry the woman of his dreams. Now, if both parties agreed to the terms in the ketubah and to the bridal price, the bride and groom would drink a cup of wine together. And then the groom would pay the mohar, or in other words, the purchase price of the bride. After paying the mohar, the bridegroom would depart to his father's house. And right before he departed, he would say this. Departed, he would say this. I go to prepare a place for you, but I will come again and receive you unto myself. Does that sound familiar? That's exactly what Jesus said after his resurrection to his disciples. He said this. I go to prepare a place for you, but I will come again and receive you unto myself. Now, Jesus did everything in building his covenant relation to a ship with us, entering into this covenant that a young groom would do with his bride. Jesus said this. He was following the Jewish customs on marriage. Now, here's what's interesting. He told his disciples before the last week as they were going to Jerusalem that he would be turned over to the Jewish authorities. He would suffer and die and be resurrected. He told them the price he would pay. That's in the ketubah. You tell the bride the price you're willing to pay, the mohar. He told his disciples the price he was willing to pay to enter into a relationship with them. He then, after there was an agreement of this, disciples really didn't take it to heart, but still, yeah, we believe you're the Christ. They had the Last Supper, which was the sharing of the wine. So they're going through this Last Supper. He's explaining all of it, just like you would in the ketubah. And then he went and actually paid the price. He died on the cross. He descended to hell. And then when all of our sins were paid for, God raised him from the dead. After that took place, after paying the price, as he's getting ready to leave, he says, I go to prepare a place for you, but I will come again and receive you unto myself. And he can't come back until the Father says it's time. Yeah. So Jesus did everything that a young groom would do when he wanted to get married to his bride. Yeah. Yeah. At that point, though, after the ketubah, they drank the wine. After he says that he's going to prepare a place for her. At that point, the bride was said to be sanctified. In other words, she was set apart to be that man's bride. Today, we say engaged. That was the betrothal. That's what had happened with Joseph and Mary. They had the ketubah. He paid the price. She agreed to it and her father they drank the wine together. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. And guess what? Before he came back to her, she was found to be pregnant. Yeah. But all of this is following Jewish wedding customs. Now, after you've had the ketubah, after you drank the wine, he says he's going away. For all intents and purposes, the bride is considered to be married even though they weren't living together as husband and wife, and even though they were not allowed to physically touch in any way. The marriage had not, had not yet been consummated, wouldn't be consummated until he came back. I'm here to tell you, our salvation has not been consummated and will not be consummated until Jesus returns for us. But that's what the rapture is all about. Jesus is coming back for his bride. Yeah. And we are his bride. Okay, I don't care if people don't like me saying this or not. That's good teaching. Now, this first part was called Kedushin, 
which means sanctification, set apart. She's set apart. She's married for all intents and purposes, but they haven't consummated it and won't until the second part of the wedding ceremony. The second part of the marriage ceremony was when the groom came for his bride, and it was called the Nisuin, which means marriage proper. It was also called Hupa, which is the canopy under which the ceremony took place. The Hupa also referred to the room or tent in which the couple would consummate their marriage. After the second part, the couple was considered to be fully married and liable to all of the responsibilities and privileges of a married couple. Now, here's what's interesting. Any couple that cohabitated without going through these two parts of the wedding ceremony were not to be considered legally married. But even worse, the Jews of Jesus' day saw cohabitation as being tantamount to prostitution. Now, normally someone will email me, where did you get that? I don't believe that's true. Well, all right. Volume 12, page number 96, coming here and saying this. Uh, Tories were at pains to safeguard the woman's right in this respect, condemning cohabitation as tantamount to prostitution if the amount fixes the man's ketubah is less than the said legal minimum and goes through that. You didn't just cohabitate together. No. Now, our culture doesn't see anything wrong with that, but when I was growing up, that was wrong. If you're a school teacher and you're living together, you get fired. Yeah. That just wasn't done. And it wasn't done in Jesus' day. No. But it's also why, and now you understand the Bible, Jesus recognized all five marriages of the woman at the well, but he did not recognize her living with a man as a marriage. No. Look at John chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. I'll show you what I'm talking about. Gosh, i got to move through fast. Go and get your husband, Jesus told her. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. Jesus said, you're right. You don't have a husband, for you have had five husbands, and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. So according to Jesus, you're not legally married without going through the official wedding ceremony. It must be legal for God to recognize it. Everyone with me? Now, because marriage was a legal covenant relationship, you had to get legally divorced to get out of it. And you could only get divorced if you had just cause. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 1 and 2. When a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it comes to pass that she finds no favor in his eyes because he hath found some uncleanness, Hebrew word erva, that's the Hebrew equivalent to the Greek word pornea. So what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 19 is the very same thing in Deuteronomy 24. He says, then let him write her a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand and send her out of his house. And when she's a part of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. And Jesus reaffirmed this in Matthew chapter 19, verse number 9. Now, if there's any questions about this, you need to listen to last week's sermon. If you still have questions, go look at my series on divorce. But my point is this. Marriage is a legal covenant relationship that you could only get out of if you had just cause and you went through a legal divorcement. So... The traditional wedding vows start with, do you take the person standing next to you to be your lawful either wife or husband? We don't just say wife or husband. We say lawful wife or lawful husband. Remember, marriage is a covenant relationship. In other words, it's a marital contract. It's why you have to have a license and you have to go down to the courthouse and have it recorded. If not, you are not legally married in God's eyes. In other words, God does not recognize your marriage just as Jesus did not recognize the woman at the well's marriage. He actually said, and the man you're living with is not your husband. Why? There was no marital contract. People, let me tell you something. I have a marital contract with Jesus. It's written in the Bible. He told me the price he would pay for me. We drank the wine together. He paid the price. And I have been sanctified, set apart for him, and I'm waiting for him to return for me. I am legally joined to Christ, and I'm one spirit with him. I'm sanctified. I'm not living with him. And it won't be consummated until he comes, and I receive my new body. That's what the consummation will be. I'll be transformed with the extra-dimensional body. Anyways, 
The second part of the traditional wedding vows is the phrase to have and to hold. Look back at the back wall and notice what the wedding vow says. Do you take this woman to be your lawful wife to have and to hold? Now this phrase was actually a legal phrase that dealt with property rights. But when it was used to marriage, it indicated the intention of the parties being joined together as one. Not two, but one. What is his is now hers. And what is hers is now his. And it was probably the best way back then to describe the command in Genesis chapter 2, verse number 24, to cleave unto each other. Notice what that verse says. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Now the word cleave is translated from the Hebrew word dabak. And it actually means to stick together, to cling to, while still maintaining your own individuality or uniqueness. So it implies two people joining together as one, while still maintaining their own individuality, their own gifts and talents, their own uniqueness. But... What is his is now hers, and what is hers is now his. Now, it's a little different in my marriage. What's mine is Lisa's, and what's Lisa is Lisa's. <laughs> That's how it works. might work that way in your marriage. But it's supposed to be what's mine is Lisa's, and what Lisa's is mine too. Yeah. That's what it means. So the phrase to have and to hold means you're promising to create a close marital bond that cannot be broken. You're stuck with each other until death separates you. You now have a marriage partner for life. And you're to hold or cleave to them until death separates you. You're to remain as one. And what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Now, here's what's interesting. Most people try to give this phrase a sexual meaning. Pushkin says that this phrase refers to the physical embrace partners share together. It's a promise of intimacy both in giving and receiving. And yes, your marriage is consummated through sexual intercourse. And yes, through sexual intercourse, you're joined to become one flesh. But you are not vowing to have sex and lots of it. That's a covenant obligation and also a big covenant blessing, but... You're vowing to have this person as your spouse for life. You're vowing to stick together. You're vowing to remain joined until death separates you. You're vowing that what is yours is also theirs, and what is theirs is also yours to have and to hope. That's why it's called a property or legal right. And they use that for the wedding vows. The third part of the traditional wedding vows is the phrase, from this day forward. Look at the back wall and notice what the wedding vows say. Do you take this woman to be your lawful wife to have and hold from this day forward? The covenant relationship has a starting point. It begins when the first vow is made. And it does not end till death separates them. Remember, a marriage covenant is in essence a marital contract. At least that's how the Bible perceives it to be. The world doesn't perceive it that way. You might not perceive it that way. But I want you to understand something. God perceives it that way. You need to understand that God is just. What does just mean? He does things legally. What does legally mean? It means he does things according to the law. God legally raised Jesus from the dead. I have legally been justified according to the law. Yeah. Yeah. So, when you get married, you're getting into a marital contract, whether you know it or not. So, your vows, or your vow includes your intention to be bound to a covenant relationship the moment the minister pronounces you husband and wife. You're vowing to take the person that's standing next to you to be your lawful spouse, to have and to hold, from this day forward. Just as soon as the pastor pronounces you husband and wife. And from that point on, you get to enjoy all the rights and privileges of a married couple. I officiated both of my daughter's weddings, and I said this to both of my son-in-laws. They might not remember this, but afterwards, I was over there talking with both of my son-in-laws at different times after they were married. And this is what I said. I just want you to know, you can now sleep with my daughter without me killing you. <laughs> yeah. My daughter Macy and her husband are... They've come down and they're staying the weekend with us. They can sleep in the same bedroom. That wouldn't have happened 
till that marriage took place. That didn't happen in my house. No. That marriage contract, that marital contract means something in God's eyes. The fourth part of the traditional wedding vow are the phrases for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, in sickness and in health. Look back at the, the back wall and notice what it says. Do you take this woman to be your lawful wife to have and to hold from this day forward for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, in sickness and in health? This portion of the wedding vow is a promise to stay faithful and committed no matter what happens. Paul was teaching on marriage in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and he was telling them, you know what? It'd be best if you all remain like me, single. But if you can't, if you burn, it's better that you marry. And then he starts going through talking about marriage. But notice what Paul said about marriage in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 28. He said that those who marry will face many troubles in this life. In other words, life will have its ups and downs, good times and bad times. But as you're traveling in this journey called life as husband and wife, good times are going to happen, but also so are bad times. And let me tell you, those bad times... The sickness, when you take care of them, you think that it would weaken your love, but it doesn't. It makes your love stronger. Some of you have lost a spouse, and at the end of that, end of that relationship with them, they, they were sick to the point that they depended on you. And you would think that'd make it, we're whew, glad that's over. But it's not that way. There's something about sticking with your spouse in good times and bad times, in sickness and in health, that you grow closer. Yeah. But this part of the wedding vow is the promise to remain faithful and committed regardless of what life throws at you. The fifth part of the traditional wedding vow is the phrase to love and to cherish. Look at the back wall, and we're going to go real quick through this. Do you take this woman to be your lawful wife, to have and to hold, from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, in sickness and health, to love and to cherish? Love means that you will have to make sacrifices in your marriage. There's going to be times, and many times, let me just say that, that you're going to have to place your spouse's needs, wants, and desires above your own. In fact, that's what love is all about. Notice how Paul described love in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 7. He didn't describe it as a feeling. He described it as an action. This is the way you act. Doesn't matter how you feel, this is the way you act. Let me tell you, I can irritate my wife like no one else. And she still acts like she loves me. And I'm sure there are times she doesn't feel like she loves me. But I always look at her when I do that and I say, forever. <laughs> yeah. Here it is. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It's not irritable. It keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith. It's always hopeful, endures through every circumstance. People, that's what you're vowing to do. It's not a feeling. I vow that I will always think you're the most beautiful thing. <laughs> yeah, I give that about 25 years and you wake up next to them. And they're breathing out of their mouth. And, Woo, that's bad breath. You always see in the movies, they wake up and kiss each other. Yeah, right. <laughs> Cherish means you recognize as your spouse's incredible value and worth. As a person, as a child of God, and as a covenant partner. And now we come to the very last part of the wedding vow. It's the phrase that says, till death do you part. Look at the back wall. Notice what it says. Do you take this woman, this is all one vow with many parts to it, to be your lawful wife, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for rich, for poor, in sickness and health, to love and to cherish, till death do you part. This phrase means that you're making a lifelong commitment. And the only thing that's going to dissolve your marital bond is death. This part of the wedding vow is based on what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 19, verses 4 through 6. Notice what it says. Haven't you read the scriptures? Jesus replied, 
They record that from the beginning God made them male and female. And he said this explains why man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. And the two are united into one. Since they are no longer two but one that no one split apart what God has joined together. Now, how many of you would like to renew your wedding vows this morning now that you know what they mean? How many of you don't want to? <laughs> I'm sorry. You've already made that vow. Maybe it's time to renew the vow. So I'll tell you what we're going to do. I'm not going to do this twice. I'm not going to say to the man. And then I ask the, uh, this vow in the form of a question. And the man says, I do. The reason I'm not going to do that is because if your wife's sitting at you, she's going to go. She's going to watch to make sure you said, I do. And did you look like you really meant it when you said, I do? Same thing with the wife. The man's going to go, yeah. But if you want to renew your wedding vows, that's what we're going to do. I'm going to say it. And if you want to renew your wedding vow, all you have to say is, I do. Well, I'll say I do at the same time. If you don't want to make that vow, remember what we taught on the difference between wedding or the difference between vows and oaths. The Bible tells us, don't make a vow and an oath that you're not going to keep. Don't do that. And if you want to say a sign to yourself, some people just don't like to do it. I thought about not doing this, but I thought, you know what? It's time that the church did things the way God says to do it. So we're going to do this. I want everyone to stand. If you're married, hold hands. If you're fighting, get over it. Love is not a feeling. Love is an action. So it doesn't matter how you feel. Paul said love is not rude. You can't be rude right now. It's not irritable. All right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this in the form of a question. I'm going to say it in a way that both men and women can actually say I do. But I want you to understand that when you say I do, this vow is to God. You're not making this vow to your spouse. You're making it to God. Here goes. Do you take the person standing next to you to be your lawful spouse, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish, till death do you part? God heard that vow. Now let me say this. Marriage is patterned after the covenant between Christ and the church. Jesus did the very same thing. All through the Old Testament, the prophets told us the price he would have to pay to redeem us, to purchase us. That's the purchase price. We just studied all of Isaiah chapter 53. Jesus came in right before the last week of his life and he started telling his disciples, we're going to go to Jerusalem. The Son of Man's going to be arrested. He's going to suffer many things, and he's going to be put to death. Just as the prophets foretold. He's telling them the price he's going to pay. And then they had the Last Supper. Because now that they know this is the covenant, and he goes into it. This is a covenant meal. The spread is my body, which is broken for you. That's the price I'm going to pay for you. This wine is the blood that is shed for you. I'm going to be the trespass offering. And then he actually pays the price. And after he pays the price and is resurrected, he says the very same thing a bridegroom says to his bride. I go to prepare a place for you. I will come back. Now, if you agree to the price that he paid and you enter in that commitment, you're sanctified. You're set apart for Jesus. And when he comes back, you're going to be joined to him forever and all eternity. And you're going to have a resurrected body. Yeah. But if you're not, you're not married to him. 
as a result of that, you don't spend eternity with God and the bridegroom, Jesus. So if you're here and you never received Jesus, you're not going to heaven when you die. Your body will be resurrected, but not to join Jesus. It'll be resurrected, you'll be judged, and then thrown into the lake of fire. Yeah, that's the second death. So if you're here and you've never received Jesus, I'm giving you that chance. I'm going to say a real simple prayer. If you want to receive Jesus, if you believe he died for your sins and God raised him from the dead, and you want him to be your Lord and Savior, all you have to do is say this prayer and believe it. Everyone, I want you to bow your heads, close your eyes. You want to say that prayer? Just repeat after me. You can even say it silently to yourself. God, I know I'm a sinner. And I know that my sin has separated me from you. But God, I believe you love me. And because you love me, you sent your son Jesus to die for my sin. And I believe that when Jesus died, his soul went to hell to pay the penalty for my sin. But I also believe that when all my sin was paid for, God, you saw so that it never sinned, even in becoming my sin. Therefore, you legally raised him from the dead, according to Leviticus 18.5. Jesus, I believe you paid the price for me. And I want you to be Lord of my life. Thank you for saving me. Now, with everyone.